Welcome to our journey of integration and differentiation, where we continue our investigations of slopes and expectations. Previously, we had looked at unrolling hills of time, and now we will take a swim in the nice warm waters of Backprop Bay. In this lecture, we will look at backpropagation and automatic differentiation. In machine learning, we use gradients to train. And training means optimizing an objective function with respect to model parameters. For example, curve fitting, fitting neural networks, or mixture models. So in general, for functions f, we want to compute its gradient, which we denote by nabla f. How do we efficiently calculate gradient? For example, this, ex this example from Wikipedia here, which is the exponent of x divided by x squared, if we take the gradient of this using symbolic manipulation, we get an expression that looks more complex. So it's not entirely obvious that things are actually as efficient, but it turns out to be true. And the reason it's true is because we cache intermediate results. So we can, we can reduce computational costs of computing the gradient if we keep intermediate values. Okay? In some sense, it's unsurprising because we trade off computational complexity for space complexity. This caching of intermediate results can be seen as backpropagation. The key idea here is that compositions of functions turns out to be the same as multiplying their gradients. Backpropagation is a special case of something called automatic differentiation. And you can rightly ask, why should we learn about automatic differentiation? Because it's already widely implemented in modern machine learning tools. I'd like to convince you that actually it's important to learn some of these concepts. And it turns out that these concepts are a very useful way to link different results in calculus and optimization. So if you ask somebody what is backpropagation, you're most likely to get this result, this answer that backpropagation is just the chain rule of differentiation. So let's recall what is the chain rule. Given two functions, f and g, if we take the composition of them, g, f first and then g be applied later, we have and we take the gradient of the composed functions, g composed with f, then we have the following result, which is that we take first take the gradient of g while keeping f constant inside, and then multiply that with the gradient of f. For vector value chain rules, we have the same result. And if the value of f is a scalar valued function, so that there's only one dimensional output of the composed function f and g, then we write down this gradient as a row vector. Why should we represent gradients of scalar valued functions as row vectors? The reason is that if we write them as row vectors, then we can think of chain rule as essentially matrix multiplication as shown on this slide. Uh, if we have a function f, which is a function of two variables, x1 and x2, where x1 and x2 are themselves function of two variables, s and t, then writing down the chain rule and just working it carefully out, we can see that it actually is just the matrix multiplication of the matrix of delta f delta x multiplied by the matrix of delta x and delta st. We, we need to be a little bit more precise about notation here when we're looking at the co compositions of functions f and g. So to do so, let us fully write out the variables x, y, and z such that y is the output of f of x and z is the output of g of y. Then we can write the chain rule in the following way using Leibniz notation. And in fact, if you look at this chain rule a little bit more carefully, the, the term in the middle, the dz dy, this actually needs a value of the intermediate variable y. So the same function again, going from x to z. And we can write a function totally that looks at the composition of f and g. And if we put it this way, we can think of the variable y 
as a cache of results from computing f of x. Okay. Let me explain a little bit this graph here, which is often referred to as the computational graph. I have variables in red, so x, y, and z, and then I've got functions f and g, which are composed. Okay. And the reason for this, this extra set of notation is so that we can refer to the variables themselves and the functions, depending on which is more convenient at that particular time. So if we just extend this to three functions, we have a function g with, it's a, comp it's a composition of functions e, f, and g. Then if we take the gradient of function big G, then we can just string together the chain rule. So we can just write down as dz dw is the combination as you see. It turns out that order matters when you're trying to do caching. So because multiplication is commutative, you can put brackets around the second two terms first, or you can put the uh, brackets around the first two gradients. Okay? And it turns out that these two different ways of putting brackets uh, imply two different ways of storing the cache, which is referred to as forward mode and reverse mode in automatic differentiation. Okay? Now, let's look at forward mode a little bit more carefully. What it's saying is that if I'm interested in the gradient dz dw, then I first compute the gradient dz dy, then I multiply it to the remaining terms in the bracket. So we accumulate it from left to right. The reverse mode goes in the opposite direction. I'm not going to get into the fight of who invented backpropagation. For those who are interested, have a look at the short article by Jürgen Schmidhuber. But I'd just like to point out that Paul Wurgos, in his PhD thesis in 1974, spoke a lot about how to calculate these gradients of compositions of functions. And towards the end of the thesis, there's this beautiful typewritten theorem, which if you look at it, looks very much like a modern backpropagation theorem. I just also like to point out that actually the idea of mechanically calculating gradients goes back to the early 1900s. So a patent by Armin Elmendorf in 1918 has this mechanical system for actually calculating the gradients of any function. So if you move one lever across a function, the other, uh, uh, the other lever moves in such a way that it draws a function of the gradient. Okay. In fact, the ideas that you will see in automatic differentiation goes back to uh, Wengertlis, which is uh, invented even uh, 10 years before Paul Wurbos. And in fact, even the computer implementation of automatic differentiation was written back in the 1980s. For more information, I'd like to point you to the survey in 2018, as well as other introductory material. Um, in 2017, there was a NeurIPS workshop on automatic differentiation, which gives you some more recent progress. So here is one way to think about automatic differentiation. The, the intuition is to associate every variable A with its derivative with respect to an output value. So imagine somewhere out there, we've got some output value and A is some variable in the middle of a long calculation. Instead of just keeping track of A, we keep track of A and its derivative, okay? And we, we keep track of, we denote this by uh, a left pointing arrow above A. Okay. Turns out that it's convenient to call this uh, extra variable an adjoint. Uh, and it, this pair of A and A arrow, we can call an adjoint pair. Okay. The idea of the pair A and A adjoint is called a dual number. Okay, back to the question of the two different modes of automatic differentiation. Imagine we have a function that takes, imagine we have a function f that takes us 
from a d-dimensional vector to an m-dimensional vector. The forward mode is particularly efficient when d is much smaller than m. And you can think of dual numbers when, by writing them directly as a matrix. So in this forward mode, we can represent dual numbers as a matrix. In reverse mode automatic differentiation, this is efficient when D is much bigger than M. Now, in many machine learning applications, the function F takes you from a high dimensional input D to a single scalar, uh, which means that M equals one. So the reverse mode of automatic differentiation is much more popular in machine learning. What makes things a bit more confusing is that actually the reverse mode automatic differentiation actually consists of two passes, one going from inputs to outputs and outputs to inputs, not just one way. So let me just work out some simple examples for forward mode uh, automatic differentiation. So imagine we have a sum uh, of two variables x and y, and we want to compute its gradients. Remember, for forward mode, we can represent dual numbers as two by two matrices, and, and we can just write two variables, x and y, as two matrices as shown. We can then just use directly matrix addition to get the result there, which we can then identify back as the dual number for x plus y. So this concludes that the gradient of a sum is the sum of the gradients for forward word automatic differentiation. Let's consider the product of two dual numbers as represented by their matrices like that. We just multiply as usual using matrix multiplication, getting the middle matrix there. If you look at that middle term, we see that the gradient of x times y is the variable x times the gradient of y plus the variable y times the, the gradient of x. This recovers the product rule of calculus, as you would expect. So let's change gears to reverse mode automatic differentiation. This is also known as backpropagation, and it has two phases. There's a forward pass and a reverse pass. The forward pass is calculated as per normal. When you evaluate a function, you need to accumulate these terms anyway. The real important part here is as you're computing this function, you cache all the partial differentials as you're evaluating forward. Now, on the reverse pass, you set the adjoint of the output node to one because the gradient of the output node to itself is clearly one. And then you increase the output adjoint by the, no. Then you increase the input adjoint by the product of the output adjoint with the forward partials that you accumulated in the forward pass. Okay. The key challenge to implement this efficiently is that computations need to be done in topological order. Let's go back to our function big G, which is a composition of three functions E, F, and G. For reverse mode automatic differentiation, remember that we bracket the first two terms. If you look at this, we can see, we can identify that the first, the term on the left-hand side of the equation is actually the gradient with respect to W, which we can denote as the adjoint of W. And the term inside the bracket is the gradient with respect to X and the gradient of the output variable Z with respect to X. And we can write this down as the adjoint of X. Okay? And hence the, the reverse mode automatic differentiation rule can be thought of as the input adjoint is just the output adjoint multiplied by the partial that takes you between these two variables, x and w. What do we do with branches? If you look at the case of the sum, for example, z is x plus y, then by just looking at the derivatives, you know that dz dx is one and dz dy is one. Okay? By applying the accumulation rule we just saw on the previous slide, the adjoint of x is the adjoint of z multiplied by dz dx, but we can see that dz dx is one, so the adjoint of x is actually the adjoint of z, and it's just 
passing through, which means that we can see that the, the add gate is actually just a gradient distributor. So the gradient coming from the output Z just gets copied to both X and Y. If you apply the same reasoning to multiplication, you can see that multiplication is actually a gradient switcher. So the output gradient, the output adjoint Z, gets multiplied by the other input variable Y to produce the gradient of X. And vice versa, the gradient of Y is the gradient of the output variable Z multiplied by the other argument X. In summary, modern machine learning is powered by automatic differentiation libraries, and it's quite useful to know what these libraries do. For forward mode, you can think of dual numbers in terms of matrix multiplication. For reverse mode, you need to observe that the input adjoint is the output adjoint multiplied by the partial derivative. How to efficiently combine forward and reverse mode automatic differentiation to compute the gradient of any given function is still an open question. And if there's anything I want you to take away from this lecture is I'd like you to remember that to think of a variable and its adjoint when thinking about computing gradients. So in summary, that propagation is just the chain rule of differentiation with caching. Thanks.